Hello friends and welcome to the Weekend Catch-Up Club, the coffee morning show brought to you live every Saturday direct to Facebook and available later on demand at youtube.com slash gamertagged. Today I am joined by an incredibly special guest yet again. I honestly am pinching myself that these people are agreeing to be on the show but I, I, I love it and I embrace every opportunity I can. This is the game director from Days Gone from Sony Bend Studios. I am joined by Jeff Ross. Hello, thanks for having me. I'm looking thank, forward to this. Yeah, thank thank you, buddy. So we, we mentioned briefly off camera there that you've recently left um, Sony Bench, Bench Studios just late last year, but I would love to be able to dive into your, your history because you were at Sony Bend from the very beginning, pretty much from when the studio first started, back when it wasn't even really known as Sony Bend. It was Eidetic, I, I think it was, back in 98. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, so... Uh, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to ask. Can can you just kind of talk about how it all started for you at at, at there originally? Okay, so the uh, it is, it's an interesting story, and I'm a bit of a long talker. So give me a give me a wrap it up signal if you feel don't I'm going worry, too long. But we're, we don't have any airtime to worry about, so we can we can just, <laughs> we can just keep it going. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm from Oregon originally, up in the Portland area. And, um, you know, I was always creative as a kid and I wanted to, you know, wanted to make movies because story was just something that I felt that I got and, and, and it hit me. You know, I was always very affected by good storytelling and I was very interested in it. So um, and this is um, since I'm such an old guy, I uh, this was in the 80s when I was in high school making uh, student films like with VHS cameras from the local cable studio. And uh, kids today editing... don't know what tape is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, just the editing that you could do there. I mean, it was. Um, it, you had to do it linear. If you, you know, if you got halfway through the movie and realized that, you know, the 10 minute point you wanted to tweak a scene a little bit, you couldn't because you would destroy everything that came afterwards. Yeah. And and the edits weren't precise anyway. So uh, it was interesting. But me, me and a couple of friends, we were industrious and we wrote scripts. We kind of assembled cast. We got budgets together just from donations from people. And uh, it, we, we would just kind of like hustle and get, the, you know, put these movies together and then put them out and they would play on cable access. And, and again, like this was when I was in high school. And they would play on cable access. That was the that was the uh, exchange for using their equipment. Um, but I, one of my one of my school jobs was I think a box boy at a grocery store. And people online would recognize me like you're the guy from that movie on TV. <laughs> and it was it was really bizarre. But uh, so I kind of got my start doing that. My love for you know like a, my my love for story and, and kind of just experiences. You know it it, uh, it was always maturing. But then when I went off to school, you know, I, you know, we kind of stopped making movies and I, I did in, at the University of Oregon, I did take a couple of film courses, but it wasn't a real film school. But, you know, I was always trying to kind of keep that fire alive. And then after college, um, I just kind of fell into a uh, blue collar job where I was delivering appliances, driving trucks. Uh, I worked at a sawmill for a while uh, doing these blue collar jobs and, and all the while uh, hating life. And, you know, just realized I'm like, oh, if, you know, I've got to do stuff creative. This just is yeah. not, it's sapping me of all my energy. And then um, I bought a computer. I got a deal on a computer. And again, this is probably the early 90s. And I'm like, this is going to be great. I'm going to organize my CD collection with this computer. <laughs> this is all I'm going to do with it. Uh, I don't know why that was my, the most important thing to me. But uh, when I was at the software store, there was a shareware disk for Doom. And I'm like, this seems interesting. So I took it home and played it yeah. and just fell in love. It was It, it had just come out. Yeah. And uh, it was really immersive, was dreaming about it all the time. And then um, I went to buy this, sh uh, you know, went to convert the shareware to the full retail one. And I, you know, I called them up. And uh, it, when the purchase was done at the end of the, end of the call, I'm like, I just talked to uh, a customer service person with a really thick Texan, Texas accent. Uh, <laughs> this was in America. Uh, wow. Video games are not made just in Japan. They're made, yeah. you know, like it, it just it never done. It, it never dawned on me that games were an industry the way that uh, music or, or Hollywood would have been. And I think a lot of developers I've talked to have kind of had that same epiphany. Like they didn't even know, but once they knew it, it, uh, it, you know, their world became all about getting in. So with Doom, um, I started creating levels for it. And, you know, they were, they were terrible because it was just me. There was no feedback, uh, <laughs> yeah. but I was learning, you know what yeah. I mean? And I was building stuff and, and kind of amassing, you know, a, a portfolio of, not necessarily quality, but initiative, you know, something that kind of mm -hmm. demonstrated, Hey, you know, I can figure stuff out. I can do this. And I was yeah. slowly learning, but like, again, no peers or mentors to kind of say, Hey dude, like, you know, have, you know, you could plus this up by doing that. So I look back on all of it and it's terrible. But, uh, <laughs> after, after doom was over, 
Quake uh, came out and I started making 3D levels for that. And then um, I think at this point I was working at a, at, a, at, a, at a tech support position for a Microsoft contractor. And I just hate, obviously hated life even worse. <laughs> you know, and and uh, again, this was probably in the mid to late 90s where uh, they had classified ads in the newspapers. You know, you didn't, there was no monster.com or Indeed or LinkedIn. So, you know, we, we found jobs, available jobs by uh, just looking in the classifieds. So every day I would just look and, you know, I was looking, you know, just at random jobs. And then I never really made it to the, to the, to the later part of the alphabet. But one day I did and it got to the, the job title was video game designer needed. And it's like, hell yeah, that's me. Yeah. And it was in, it was in central Oregon, which, you know, it, uh, it was a couple hundred miles, 150 miles from Portland, about a three hour drive. It's kind of central Oregon's this Mecca for people in Oregon to come to on the weekends from, from a lot of out of staters to come and, uh, just kind of enjoy the wilderness and the mountain and the lakes and just everything about it is very, it's a, yeah. it's a very tourist friendly town. So anyway, uh, I applied and, uh, just by sheer luck, I think the, the lead designer on, on Siphon Filter One had seen some of my, my, uh, my quake work. I, I don't know how, but he did. And so that just kind of, just kind of struck him and they invited me over and I interviewed and, uh, nailed it. And then they brought me on, um, I wasn't there from the very beginning because the game was under development. Idetic had a, Idetic even had an identity before it was Idetic. Uh, yeah. It was like blank for Len something, and then they became Idetic and they made Bubsy on the PlayStation One with Bubsy yeah. 3D, which is notorious for being terrible. <laughs> um, but but it's actually a, it, it's really interesting. And I was I, I wasn't part of it. Uh, John Garvin wasn't part of it. Um, just uh, very few people left at the studio were actually part of uh, part of Bubsy. But uh, it, it's it's funny to make fun of. It's fun to make fun of. But um, it without Bubsy 3D, there would never would have been a siphon filter one, and yeah. so on. And then there wouldn't have been a Days Gone. So yeah. uh, the things that they learned how to create that 3D engine, um, you know, the camera, the camera in Bubsy was really kind of it was it was very rigid. Yeah. In siphon, it started to get some special sauce and started to feel mm -hmm. good and feel right. But yeah. uh, well, and, and I think 3D was still success. very. It was very early in the industry as well. Where oh, yeah. was, developers were still trying to work out how to how to navigate in that three dimensional space. With like, it's not the control schemes that we take for granted today. It's it was working out. We didn't have dual analog sticks back then. We we got them right. very very quickly after that. But it was still okay. How does this control? How can we move the camera in a three dimensional space? And how does movement work in a three dimensional space? And as 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 you said, it's, it's working a lot of that stuff out. That is the building blocks for the future titles that we we're now seeing, obviously today with Days Gone. Yep. Yeah. And, and the same guy who worked on the camera for all of those games worked on, uh, we worked on a camera pretty late. Another engineer sort of took that over, but uh, that, that engineer, uh, he, he's just, he's a genius and he, he gets the, he gets how physics translates to feel and he's, uh, he's never happy. So it's, you know, he'll noodle on something till the very end. And, uh, he, uh, he was the engineer who kind of spearheaded the horde in our motorcycle on, oh, on wow. days down. So two, wow. yeah, exactly. And so it, it, it it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because those are two of like the the more acclaimed aspects of the game. I was involved with it, but this guy was really the he was the expert. He was the guy who made it all happen, and so we all benefit from his uh, his excellence. Yeah. But uh, we had we had some input, but yeah, it's just you can put that guy in a room and he'll come up with something brilliant that feels great. That's super interesting because you, you, as you said, it's it's the feel of something you know it when you feel it. But to get yeah. there is almost this insurmountable like challenge. It's, it's like okay, I don't quite know what I need to accomplish, but I know it when I feel it. And yes, you can't yes. really quantify that. As you just kind of either stumble upon it, or you know roughly what you need to do. But as until you you crack it, and then you how good it feels, that's when you know you've 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 nailed it. And and yeah, you mentioned the bike, which I'm sure we'll get into like specifically later on because I'm a I'm a huge biker. You're a huge biker, and the feel of that bike in the game is 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 just fantastic. But uh, no, that's really really fascinating. It's all about like the feel of physics. That's not necessarily something. How, how physics actually are but it's how it feels right, it, it right. should be yeah if, if it was just how they are it would be easy right yeah <laughs> you know you just kind of write a simulation and then you, you, you know but no it, it's that application of psychology and emotion and feel and player expectations and all that and 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 you're right and i think that uh what, what you touched on is probably a theme that we could hit a, in a bunch of different points later is um you don't know what you don't know until you know yeah. and yeah. when you're going into something it's like you know like and this is a great stress for game designers is create the design document that's going to be the you know just enough writing to uh, communicate things and nothing more but then you have other team members who maybe want all the answers but most of those answers have to come from them 
you know, and they have to start asking those questions and answering them themselves. So it's a, it's an interesting um, uh, trend in development where uh, the tools are getting so uh, kind of so uh, democratized that um, you don't need an engineer to accomplish a lot of this stuff anymore. And so that it, that iteration moves into the design side and uh, they can, you know, we created some things on Days Gone that were kind of that experience that you talked about where, all right, we got this general idea of what this tool is going to do. Uh, we're going to get in and do it. And then we're going to reflect on it and say, well, what works, what doesn't? Let's go back and tweak this. And it, it uh, th that was really actually how a lot of things in Days Gone got built was with that kind of figure it out as you go. Like, you know, we had an idea, we had a vector, but we didn't know all the, all the details. And we would just, yeah. uh, we would iter iterate. And that's the thing that is, uh, you know, what designers are known for is just iterating. And, yeah. and just, you know, yeah. never, never being happy, just always trying to, you know, you, you got to find a point to be happy. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you don't, it's, it's never your first pass, last pass. It's like writing. Yeah. You know, all uh, writing is rewriting. The creative process, it would be so easy if we just knew exactly what you had to do with that blank page from right. the very beginning. It's, it's so iterative and experimentation, making mistakes. And like, is that working? It's, it's, it's like stirring the pot of ideas constantly until you land on something that's, oh, well, that's actually beginning to form together now. And it's the same with all types of design, whether it, whether it's marketing campaigns or like digital experiences uh, for different products or, or whatever, or, or game design. It's, it's really ex experimentation. If, if you have the flexibility and freedom and time, obviously, as well, to experiment until you, you nail it and then you begin to kind of iterate on that and, and begin to really craft something which is coming together and you're thinking yeah we're on to something here yeah for sure it, it's like we've lived the same life here yeah <laughs> absolutely <laughs> absolutely so i'm sorry i i think we, we got a little bit sidetracked but please please continue with them oh uh yeah so aside from filter one i came in with about a year to go and uh richard ham was the lead designer on it and he was the only designer at the studio and the, i think the game had about we'll, we'll say 20 missions um he gave me five or six of mission, you know, five or six missions to do. He didn't split it in half like it. And, uh, you know, and it was great because I was still learning the tools and everything. But uh, yeah, I just dove in and it was like a, a finally a chance where I could kind of apply my uh, my storytelling background with my, my 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 love of game design. Levels for Siphon Filter 1 were mostly created by the art team. I would go through and kind of massage them, but I wasn't doing level layout like I'd been doing in Doom or Quake at that point. But uh, I was creating actual missions and, and staging cinematics and kind of scripting it all together. And uh, did that for about five or six missions. And, you know, Richards were always better. The guy was, you know, he was, he just had an attention to detail that I was real, always really impressed and driven by. But on, on Siphon 2, he gave me a little bit more uh, to do. And then uh, on Siphon 3, um, he left about halfway through development on that. And we had, we had, fortunately, we had hired one designer already. So we were a team of three that was now down to two. And so I got like this uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, brevet field promotion to lead designer. Uh, at that point, and yeah. it, really, the game the game had been designed. It was you know it, like it, it was a it, it, the die was already cast. It just okay. had to be finished. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I'm really proud of with that was you know I think that he left in probably like March or April of the year that it shipped in September. And there was a foundation of work, but it nothing was done. And he had even introduced this concept of mini games that uh, were a really fun way of kind of hacking the system that we built into creating these. Kind of dynamic, uh, super uh, random experiences that were um, they were scripted. It was a combination of scripting and hand population, but uh, there was a lot of work to be done. Yeah. And what I'm really proud of is I think just from the beginning, just as a as a concession to development and production, I'm like, all right, we'll get rid of these, you know, this world right here because it does feel uh, a little much, and this will make it put the game within striking distance. Yeah. I, I pulled in a producer, a great guy. Uh, he was from Sony, uh, Ron Allen. He wanted to be a designer. So I gave him all the mini games to work on, and you know he just kind of kicked ass there. Uh, our other designer, Mike Krizanowski, the 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 third, uh, he he picked up a huge uh, uh, chunk of the work and got it done. But we both just, you know, it crunch is a, obviously not an awesome thing, but we yeah. we bent over backwards to to do whatever it took to get it done, and uh, it shipped uh, a week early. I think that we you know we went gold a week early wow. just because you know it was uh, even though it was really tough, it was like <laughs> it, you know like it, it it's probably like the it's a, it's a strong side of me as a designer and a bad side, which is I'm really pragmatic. You yeah. know, I really, it's like, I can noodle on this forever, but it's not going to be, you know, like I, it's kind of reached diminishing returns. Yeah. So, uh, so we did ship a week early and we were targeted to come out on September 21st, 2001. And uh, the cover of the box, the, the box art for Cypher Filter 3 was um, uh, the U.S. Senate blowing up. <laughs> that's relevant today so, as this ever been <laughs> there you go yeah wow. yeah so I, I don't know how many how many copies they'd built out but it was it was going to sell a couple million copies and yeah. they you know they built a lot of those but they pulled them all back and uh 
they, so they delayed the release until November and uh, changed the box art to something really terrible, but neutral. <laughs> Okay, yeah, <laughs> and uh, released it amidst uh, Grand Theft Auto Three and Metal Gear Solid Two, you know, yeah, and it did okay. Yeah. And it, it yeah. you know, it uh, like I said, the series was started out is super innovative, but then you know, two was great. Three, three was kind of like a, a kind of a, a greatest hits or kind of a, a, a like one of those TV shows where they have the flashbacks. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it yeah. just kind of felt like it didn't feel like it had the right thrust. <laughs> it was a fun experience. It, you know, I, I would say in some ways it's it's a, it's better because we made stealth. You know, we improved some stealth features, but you know, as a whole, the product had kind of grown stale at that point. Yeah, but uh, as, it came out, it did well. Challenging as well because because of the of the, the the bookends in which you're launching between of Rock, Rockstar's Grand Theft Auto Three and Kojima's <laughs> Metal Gear Solid. It's like how how can you carve out uh, an audience when everybody's looking forward to like these games as well? And I, and I know there's so like huge interest in Slife and Filter, but. You think when you're going up against those two juggernauts, is that's incredibly challenging as well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they won. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, uh, I I still hold hold bated breath that we're going to see you know someday the resurgence of Siphon Filter. I, I hear I hear mumblings and rumors, but um, I I still hope that we that series will come back and um, fully fully deserving of like a remake or a reboot or whatever that that looks like but um because it's such a popular franchise that is very fondly remembered as well and it, and it's been 14 years so I'd, I'd love to see it come back at some point whatever whatever shape or form that is um i, I hope it does come back you know we we've, we've entertained the idea in kind of thinking what that would be and uh you know i gotta tell you i'm stuck on it because um before siphon one there was uh goldeneye and yeah. maybe metal gear one right like they were the kind of the only adjacent things yeah um uh one year at e3 i think while we were working on omega strain i was at the hotel in i think it was in santa monica for some reason and i had to get to the convention center and i'm standing outside and the cabs are coming by slow and uh one finally shows up and i get in and there was a guy who was standing behind me in line i'm like you going to e3 and he was and so i gave him a ride and as we went well he was the executive producer on the original um splinter cell you know, so we got to talking. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it, this was like, uh, God, so many years ago. I can't like 17 years ago. But I'll paraphrase what he said it was like, yeah, we we basically stole what you guys did. What you guys did was <laughs> show that you don't need the bond license to create a really cool kind of espionage type title. So they, yeah. you know, they built their own and blew it out. I mean, they uh, it, let's just say they were inspired, you know, they were inspired by us. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, they not stealing because they just did everything so much better and uh, really kind of raised the bar. And I think that that was the thing that the Bend being a small studio is just immediately outclassed against all those resources at, at Ubisoft on that. So, um, you know, they when we talk about a siphon filter game, I'm like, well, we got to compete with Splinter Cell. And Splinter Cell has had so many iterations now that in that combined with siphon filter and then even, you know, Call of Duty is, mm -hmm. is in a similar, you know, siphon filter is this espionage military vibe. Yeah. And it exists somewhere kind of in between. So, like, it's all been done in a lot of ways. Oh, and it's also Hitman ish, you know. So, yeah. Um, yeah, all, totally. all of those things, those games are those games are doing those things so well. So, mm -hmm. you know, where's the blue sea for Siphon Filter is yeah. the question to, to be answered. Like, why does the world, why does this game need to exist? Mm -hmm. I don't have it. I don't know what it is. Uh, you know, yeah. to the best of my knowledge, nobody at Ben still does, but it's um, a lot of there, there's a desire are... to. Yeah, a lot of those Go games are, are really um, like they're, they're riffing off each other, both mechanically and thematically, of of like the, the military tactical stealth action genre. And you know, Splinter Cell is going through a real kind of identity crisis right now as well because it's been silent for so long. And uh, every E three or or big convention that comes along, I, you know, we, the gamers, uh, myself included, obviously keep getting a heartbroken thing. Are we going to see like whatever the next Splinter Cell is going to? Are we are we going to see that like? have a resurgence as well and it's it's tough because the like the industry is so different now it's it's you're either chasing like the open world format or you're chasing like a, like a linear uncharted-esque kind of experience as well and, and it's like where do these systemic games fit into it and there's still a huge um audience there that love that that kind of niche but it, it's really difficult to 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 map out what a splinter cell looks like what a siphon filter looks like in in today's industry as you said yeah for sure and i think that players have gotten so 
so used to the the systemic games and the open world games. And uh, you know, I, I would proffer that those games are actually easier to build than a Uncharted. You know, even a even a subpar Uncharted is immensely difficult and expensive to build because like you're curating every moment, you know, and it, it's a, to be a very specific thing and you blow that out uh-huh. with, with systems, you know, it, you basically, you have to seed it with a lot of stuff, but the players can have a million experiences that are unique, yeah. lower, low, lower resolution or fidelity than, you know, you know a very, a very custom moment in those other games. But uh, I know me as a, as a player um, and as a designer kind of, you know, like I, I, it, it's tough to go back to something that is just so straightforward and, and, and narrow. So I think that, that you know that could be a, a the design mindset going into it. It's like okay, well, how do we not just do the one and done linear narrative thing? You know, how do we add this this depth and this replay? Uh, it, you know, that really players that add the value and the immersion that players are looking for. And yeah. with with a game like Splinter Cell and and uh, you know Siphon Filter, like let's just say you make either one of those like an open world system you know, systems game. Well, all of their dramatic tension exists in the, in the 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 ticking clock of we got these spies or these terrorists are over here going to blow this thing up. We got to get in there and just get defuse a bomb. Yeah. When you have choice and agency to move around it, uh, you, you know, the player's going to get off that, that rail and explore. And then you're losing that dramatic tension. Like yeah. Yeah, it'll never, ever have the right impact. Yeah. That's always a problem with, with open world games uh, fundamentally, because they're, they're, they're jam packed of stuff to do side activities with that golden path through line of the main quest. Uh, where like the world is at stake or whatever the, the kind of the ultimate goal is to to save the world but then you've got this person over here that is like this this maybe deep narrative side quest but then you've lost all the agency of that through line of of the main quest and it's really really tough to balance it and and open world design by its very nature really struggles to keep that agency because you want players to explore the world and explore all of this stuff that that developers pack into these games and some of them are spectacular for sure but then usually not always but usually the the main quest suffers dramatically because of that lack of agency because of you you're you're pulling their attention away from that through line into all the other stuff that, that is kind of around it so it's um I, as much as i love open world games i do really love slightly more condensed more linear experiences as well mm-hmm. just just because you get a really curated story and hopefully a, a really curated experience as well that is constantly driving towards something and and the, i think one of some of the some of the better ones that have really done it well are probably uh, like miles morales the spider-man games and um, the the spider-man from 2018 as well it's an open world New York City, but it's it doesn't feel so overblown with with distractive activities that you still got those that that main kind of target to to keep the momentum going and keep the emotion yeah. high as well. And and get, those games do do it really quite well. But it's it's, it's tough. It's really really challenging. It, it is, and you know, just for the record, I mean, I, I love a, a healthy linear game as well. Uh, Last of Us One and Two are some of the best games ever made, as are all the Uncharted's and all that. So. Uh, I, I love those in, because it's a specific experience you're not going to have anywhere else. And they're very cinematic and, and awesome. Yeah. So I love all types, but I'm just saying it's kind of mo- mostly as a developer. I'm like, ooh, going back is going back to that is um, not exciting to me in any way, in, in yeah. any way, shape or form. And when it comes to open worlds, I'm, I've got an operating theory. I think we delivered on this to a certain extent in, in days gone. But uh, I, I think that the press didn't appreciate some of this stuff or, you know, there's a there's a lazy uh, critique that people have about open world games, which is they say, oh, it's repetitive, right? You know, and it's like, how can you argue that? Because it is, yeah. right? But it's not, yeah. it, it, you know, there, there, there are sub layers to that that I think uh, can mitigate the notion, uh, you know, like uh, uh, basically a, a templated experience is great because the player understands, you know, all of the tells about the beginning and the middle and the end and the interface for getting in and out. The thing is, it just shouldn't feel like a template to the player. Like, you know, the, the content yeah. itself, needs to kind of like pop and rise above it but it can still mm-hmm. exist within some sort of structure that allows you to create something and scale it you know create yeah. a number of versions of it so yeah. um but i think in in uh, days gone we we did this i think that we we didn't do it perfectly but what we did we didn't really in our opinion have anything in the world that the player could do that deacon wouldn't be doing or shouldn't be doing himself you know so in, in that way everything kind of connects back to uh, either the the aesthetic of the of the experience, just the the meta game, or it's got some sort of narrative connection to it. it. You know, it's got some narrative meaning. 
uh, is not advancing the main story, but it's 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 a uh, it's going deeper into the world and to mm -hmm. you know what the you know what the player would be doing. An example of what we wouldn't do in something like that is like put a pinball mini game in just because we want to have a bunch of mini games, right? <laughs> yeah, and we would um, make a whole lot of sites necessarily. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so I, I think that that's the way for for open world games to just really kind of stay the course and and um, not let side content um, feel like it's detracting from the main experience because mm -hmm. it's enriching it and, and kind of adding adding to it. Uh, should players elect to do it or not? Um, so, I, you know, it's an operating theory. I think we stuck to it a little bit. Uh, we, where we, we, we stuck to it a lot in our opinion. We, and we even in, in added the storylines, uh, thing to the menu to kind of mm -hmm. really connect the dots on, okay, well, this Nero checkpoint you're going, you're getting into if without the storyline wrapper, it just, uh, felt like it felt pretty good, but it, it, it could, it, the connection wasn't always being made between players and the, you know, like the, how essential it was to the world building, yeah. but by incorporating it in this storyline where you could kind of on completion have some sort of like description of it and even a description of it before and everything and, and the player could uh, see how that language you know like because it was all, all in deacon's voice and it would all kind of connect back to some part of the you know the main story or its character and and again i, I think that that's uh that, that's my advice to designers working on games like that it's just to uh, uh keep it keep it grounded and, and have a sniff test for all of the zany ideas because developers have a million of them doesn't mean they should be in yeah. the game yeah, I know exactly. That, 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 the storylines aspect was one of the, the parts of the game which I really appreciated and thought it was really well done because you could easily, not just from a, from, a, from a gameplay perspective, but even from a UI perspective of the menus and everything, you could just see, okay, these are all my storylines that are active at any given point and you can see which ones, which activity would feed into that. And mm -hmm. it was just really good, good player feedback from, from that aspect of the game. It's like, so you know exactly where you are, you know exactly what you're doing. It makes sense, and um, the the game is just filled with little great touches of from the from the the core mechanics to like movement and combat, just to the way in which the player like feels in the game. A, a lot of third person games can often feel quite like floaty or not really in the environment, and I guess it goes back to that that um, topic that we mentioned earlier about the feel of physics of things in the world. Do, does Deacon feel like his feet are actually planting in the ground. Does it feel like he's sliding in the mud? And and all of these touches that you kind of only get from AAA game development, but but when it's there, it, it feels like so good. And yeah. things like 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 popping the the hood of the cars to scavenge for scrap. It's not just like a random box put somewhere that it'll kick open and then it'll take the resources out of there. He actually has to go and. From from a logical standpoint, okay, he has to go into this car and then forage around for like a a, a filter to create the silencers, to scavenging little bits of scrap. Or if it's a pickup truck, usually there's going to be a jerry can uh, of fuel on the back of a pickup truck because that yep. makes sense yep, yep. in the world. It's all of this yeah. stuff that it just feeds into the believability of that world, and it's something I hugely appreciated. And I know a lot of a lot of uh, the audience really bonded with with days gone as a game and um i think we had high hopes for it and a lot of gamers myself included just really really enjoyed it and it's obviously getting a a major resurgence again which is great to see because of that playstation 5 patch which just came out um yeah. a, a week or so ago so that's wonderful to see and that must be really great as a developer to see how how the game is kind of blossoming and finding new audiences but, uh, on an entirely new generation of, of hardware as well. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm so excited it's out on the, on the five because of the, the 60 frames per second. And, you know, I mean, the thing about Days Gone is, you know, it's uh, the elephant in the room is we're all really proud of it. There is a great game in there, but it's got, it's got problems. In fact, it was the first version of our open world engine built on Unreal, which isn't great for open world uh, at the time, at least, um, you know, so, there, the, the, a lot of the flaws that were there at launch are gone now. Uh, just yeah. performance issues. There's still, you know, there's still some weird loading things that don't come in. But by and large, just the hardware upgrade made a lot of made, made a huge difference, and it lets players um, see the game for what it is, not dealing with with the bad frame rate and everything. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it was bad frame rate in some areas. It was, but in the problems people would have, like you know, some people would have, most people would have no problems, but the people who had problems had every problem imaginable. You know, so it was just this kind of like <laughs> this this uh, this thing where like their their experience was getting more and more negative, uh, and that's what the reviewers had. 
So, um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate about that. It's one of those games that's got like a plus 10 user uh, feedback score on Metacritic, yeah. you know, so that makes me feel good. Um, I thought the game was going to be about an 80, you know, like get, I think, you know, open sure. world games don't get the respect that they have. So I, I think my prediction was uh, anywhere from a 79 to an 82 was my kind of like window. I'm like, it's going to be somewhere in there. Yeah. Coming in at a 72 and then a 71, like that, that, that sucked because it was the, uh, the headline. You know, yeah, and the the yeah. the use the user score is uh, you know where you win, but that's like a retraction printed a month later in on page seventeen or something. Where, yeah, know, when nobody, nobody's paying attention yeah. to that at that point. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I, um, I, 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 where I agree. I, was going with that, but, uh, I agree because I, I was I was seeing a lot of the like the critical reviews and uh, and I was playing and I thought like really are, are we honestly playing like the same game because it's there's, there's a lot of so so much great stuff here like the presentation bar was really really high the the performance capture the like what you were doing with unreal engine which as you said wasn't really built to be a open world engine it's not like it's um uh the like the snowdrop engine or or dice's engine for these huge like landscapes um but you managed to create not only an open world with with our new engine, but it was it was visually an, an incredibly high bar. Like the graphical fidelity on the on the PlayStation Four base, and I was playing on the PS Four Pro. Like the just the the, the post processing effects, the depth of field effects, um, you know, photo mode. I'm a I'm a huge fan of, and whenever you jump into photo mode, you can really scrutinize like texture quality and the detail of. Uh, the way like, weapons look, the way fabric looks, you can really get into the the nitty gritty. The, you know the bike suspension, the pistons on on the on the, the bike and everything. Yeah. You can really yeah. scrutinize a a, a a a crazy macro level. And uh, I, I I was just and I was talking to friends about it as well. It's like we this is a really good game. It's like why is it getting all of these like. Like all, not like almost negative kind of kind of feedback, and I, maybe it was just purely from a performance level because, as you said, now that it's on PS Five, it's it's running incredibly incredibly well. New people are finding it and saying, "This is that this is a last generation game." Holy crap! We we didn't realize, and uh, and now they're they're finding it and saying, "Okay, that Days Gone is a, is a is a franchise you should pay attention to because it was doing stuff that was fantastic in it, and um, just that core." Um, fluidity of of Deacon's movement um, with the combat encounters with the the freaker hordes, which I still today I, I play on easy because they they terrify me. Whenever I see a, a wave of, of of like fifty to hundred freakers, I'm like, nope, I'm not going near them. I'm just gonna hide in the bushes and wait till they pass along. Yeah, yeah, you know, and um, <laughs> w- one of the uh, one of the great paradigms we had, and you know, other games have talked about this. So you know, I'm not saying that we did anything innovative, but um, Really, kind of letting the player play it their way was really important to us. And and uh, you know, knowing that it, it, all these systems interacting were going to lead to a lot of context where the players could make their own decisions for what to do. And you know, early early on, while I was dealing with the heartbreak of the the low Metacritic score, you know, I would read Twitter stories or Facebook. Like you know, Facebook and Twitter and uh, Reddit were incredibly. Po- I mean, they were like our support for yeah. uh, you know feeling bad as developers. And like it's it's weird that the internet can can, can you know provide that kind of consolation. You don't expect it, but uh, it, it, there, there was not a lot of toxicity there. But what we saw were great user stories. And one of the, one of the first ones I read was somebody said, and this description just sounded like a shit show. It just sounded mm, like yeah. the worst experience ever. Uh, I got chased by a horde. I ran up to a radio tower. It was like three in the morning. Uh, I was stuck up there. They were down below trying to get to me. And I just waited there until dawn. I'm like, oh, this does, sounds terrible. Like, this is like you just, <laughs> you know, it might have been 10 minutes. <laughs> exactly. And, and, then, and then they're like, but then when Don broke, the horde left and went back to their cave. And I was able to slide down the ladder and, and uh, you know, get out of there. And yeah. it, um, it, it and, and, like, and it was awesome. So it, it uh, there were a lot of those moments where people would just talk about how they're hiding from a horde or how they're, you know, they're fighting a horde and they're, you know, they're, they're pulling it through the map while they reload. And then it joins forces with another horde because they pulled it in the wrong direction. Uh, and or you know just stories about the bike you know, you know jump through the air and they landed in the middle of the horde and you know, <laughs> neither survived or didn't, didn't. and uh, you know we knew that that would happen but we didn't you know we knew that that type of stuff would happen but we're, I'm still really still surprised by some of the outcomes you know like yeah. you know they're possible but you don't enumerate them all in your head you can't and uh, it, it's a it's so yeah I think that 
that's the heart of the open world. You know, the, the story and the missions just kind of like, you know, utilize some of it, but the, the open world itself is almost like this thing where um, if we could have done, you know, like it, it wasn't a burden for us to meet, but um, I, I think that people, there's a lot of fun to be had. It's a, it's an infinite sandbox in some mm-hmm. way. It's a pretty shallow sandbox, which I think is where, you know, room for the, for the series to improve in the future is to kind of just really deepen that a little bit, uh, yeah. but keep the same general idea of like, we don't care what the specific, as designers, we don't say, you must do this, this, and this thing that are going to, that would culminate in the final thing. We just say, do the final thing. And yeah. if it's as simple as getting there, um, we just put a horde in the middle. <laughs> you know? And then it's like, now all of a sudden, you have a, you have a lot of gameplay. And, and that's the type of stuff that on, on like Golden Abyss or all of our other games, to create uh, five minutes of gameplay would take a month. And you know, in this case, and we, would, we would hyperscript, you got to kill eight guys here before the sniper comes out there. And then when he's dead, then he's going to fall this way and drop the key to the door that he's, you know, and it's yeah. like, all of that is gone. We didn't have to do, we had to do very little of that. And um, yeah. in general, there was a lot of, there's a lot of scripting to make it so we didn't have to script other things that, you know, there were a lot of scripting went into the systems to make that happen as, as a, instead of into the instances of every encounter. So yeah. it was, it was an awesome paradigm shift. Yeah. That, that's something that I, I, I really loved about, about the horde because you, you go into uh, uh, some games thinking, okay, something as, 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 a headline feature as the horde must be scripted to appear at these times and will 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 always stay within this area until you've dealt with it that's like a, a typical game thing that players kind of kind of expect but it was it's so it's, it was designed to be so dynamic that it does it is like a, as a roving horde it does move and um as you said like do you avoid the horde do you take it on do you do it in different ways experiment with like the weapon sets or the traps or the the environment i am um, obviously the, the the lumber yard comes to mind where you could prep the environment and lure it in and and break it up and funnel it and filter it that way and really mess around with this really malleable game mechanic but also the 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 opposite of that is okay the horde's out so that means i can go into that cave where mm-hmm. their den was and i can now make that opportunity to to forage around in there whilst they're like it's nighttime that means they're outside so i can go in there or do i wait for them all to sleep and then go into their nest and and mess around with it that way and yeah it's or, really or set traps thing. while they're out at night yeah you know, wait for them to come back and do it. Yeah, yeah, no, all, yeah all of those things are true <laughs> and, and and that's a good example of like the objectives i was talking about earlier some of our nero gear some of the collectibles were in caves or near ca- uh, horde horde locations and um, yeah, you could kill the horde and go in and get it, or you could wait for them to leave and go in and get it. Like all the yeah. system was asking was, do you have it? You know, and <laughs> again, like just the previously, we would have to do a ton of scripting just to even kind of, you know, say, well, in order to do that, we got to do it. It's like, it, it's just crazy how less work can lead to more awesome results. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome stuff. Now, I'm I'm really excited for for where the franchise is going to be going in the future. So, but well, can we talk a little bit about motorbikes because the the but the bike in the in the game is such a, a core like mechanic as well. Like the way that thing handles the physics of it, the way it, it bounces with the soft suspension is obviously a a key part of Deacon's character. Um, it's a key part of the survival of the world as well. You got to maintain it. You got to um, keep it fueled up. You got to look for fuel. Um, it's 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 was, I, I really bonded with it, and I think that was what exactly what you were you were hoping would happen. And I know I, I'm probably biased as well because I am a biker. So I was like, of course I've got to take care of my bike. It's it's my lifeline in, around this world. So we got to we got to make sure it's okay. But also how you know the feeling of it as well. A lot of a lot of games they they do good work on like the car physics. Like the car handling is usually pretty decent. Um, but usually motorbikes just feel horrible in yeah, in like yeah. open world games. Whereas the first time I did um, like my wheel spin, uh, foot down, like winging it around on the handlebars, and then off you go. I think, oh, finally, a great feeling handling motorbike in in a game. Yeah, no, it, mm-hmm. it's uh, it and the horde are the two great things about it. And it's it, like I said, we've got a genius programmer. We had a designer working on it, and so you know it. Uh, that I don't want to say it fell into our laps, but we kind of got it for free because this guy was a genius. And, you know, again, it wasn't perfect, but we would give feedback and we iterated the whole time. But um, we, you know, we had that, but what we all, it, it's interesting because what we, 
how we started Days Gone, we kind of just pitched it. I wasn't even game director at the time. I was just uh, one of the co-lead designers. And, and I, I talked the studio into doing open world because I wanted to do it, you know, and, and, and without even thinking it through. And they said, sure. And then so we had to, you know, <laughs> then we had to, we had to figure out what, what that meant, right? You know, and, uh, it, it, and since, you know, we'd gotten rid of our entire tool set, there were a couple of years where this early version of Unreal 4, we didn't have any tools and stuff. So there was just a lot of talking about what the game would be. And um, people aren't good with uh, entertaining uh, new ideas that they can't feel right away because it's just it's scary. There's a lot of unknowns there. And um, as we, you know, at, at one point early on, um, I was uh, in my office thinking about ways that we could have a, a vehicle upgrades. And I, and I thought of how the player could build bikes, all kinds of bikes. I'm like, well, because yeah. we can't do every vehicle like Grand Theft Auto does. We have to, we have to make an acknowledgement to scope. I'm like, well, what yeah. if like he could find parts and build a bike? He could build a, he could build a motorcycle. He could build a dirt bike. I mean, he could build all these different things. And right around the same time, and John and I were, John Garvin and I were in a meeting, and Chris Reese, the studio director, came in, and John and I said this at the same time, where he's like, I, he's like, I think we should go Sons of Anarchy. And I'm like, well, I'm thinking about bikes. This is great. So like, we both kind of came to this, this, this thing, and uh, that became the thing. Later on, as we tried to, you know, we were trying to figure out the open world systems and the meaning behind everything. Um, survival, you know, survival games were really trying to, were really kind of hitting their stride on Steam, especially like, uh, in a, and I'm talking like Daisy um, and, and, and similar ones where there, there's obviously something there because they're huge and they, they drive. There's a lot of engagement. And uh, we're like, yeah, this is in the apocalypse because relatable was always one of our our, our key words. And um, real quick, the question came up, do we do survival mechanics? And we tried them all. We tried food, water, uh, gas, um, repairing, uh, maybe a couple of those. And, you know, this is early on without any of the HUD stuff, without any of the immersion that, you know, like a, when you're playing a game early in development, you don't have the skin in the game that you do when yeah. you're playing it at home and you've yeah. got to save, like you've got 10 minutes of play without any save. You know, if you're a developer, you can just escape and jump back in and use a cheat code to get it. So without that mindset, which we don't have when we're developing, it's really tough to project and see how these things are going to feel. Right. But they, but on the surface, they seem stupid. So uh, in, in the case of the, wa the food and water, it, uh, I know it worked in other games, but it just didn't seem to be our attitude, okay. uh, you know, the, the, the attitude that we wanted to have. So that's when um, I cut those and then over indexed on the, the bike repair uh, and, and, the, and the fuel and, and, yep. and, and basically said, yes, we are a survival game, but it is about the idea of survival in the world and the story, but really about maintenance on the bike without, without yeah. it feeling like a chore. Yeah, and well, it would have been a different did, game if, if you leaned into yeah. like like food and crafting and and like water and supplies. It's an entirely different game at that point. It was almost like management sim, like for yep, for, yep, di yep. for different factions. It's a it's a totally different game. Yeah, and nobody at the studio was interested in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, being being a triple A AAA first party title, like there's there's things that Steam games, indie games can get away with that uh, you know something with uh, with bigger audiences, bigger budgets. You gotta, you gotta kind of like mitigate some of these risks somehow, or you gotta take calculated risks. So um, on on the bike, it, it it did answer kind of it helped us answer a little bit more firmly the identity of the game. But uh, really, I I had to start couching it under why this. I asked the design team to think about friction, you know, a way to kind of just always add a little bit of uh, uh, kind of like reality into every moment without it being dragged. Yep. And um, there, this line that I came up with was, uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't a, a, a survival horror game. It wasn't a survival game. It was a action survival game, yeah. which meant that it's a light version of survival. Mm -hmm. The vibes that we get from these other games without the work, without the minutia. And, um, it, it, and that was a really galvanizing kind of concept for me to kind of say, nope, this doesn't meet that. Like, you know, this is above that or it's below it. Yeah. So it can't come in. And um Later on, what we did was, you know, I think that having the bike being uh, one of our marketing catchphrases was make it essential for survival. Mm -hmm. And um, that allowed us to um, really pile on and say, okay, cool, we're going to have saddlebags on the bike that you can, you know, you can upgrade it and you get saddlebags so you don't have to return home to get ammo all the time. You can load up on it here. Um, you can increase, obviously, the, the gas and everything. But um, it, it led us to, okay, if the bike is essential for survival, what does that mean as well? Like, how, you know, how can we have a little bit of real world friction? Because it's a game after all, but how, you know, to, enough friction to kind of keep the player grounded into this action survival yeah. concept. And um, that's where fast travel, fast travel was always one of the ideas that, yeah, you have to have your bike in order to fast travel, right? Like, so um, that created some interesting uh, kind of moments where players wanted to get out. It, it, we didn't have to put any, uh, we, we did, is you can't fast travel while in combat. But uh, it just making the player be back at the bike and not in combat 
created some great moments of tension where they're like, all right, I got to leave the bike here. Either it ran out of gas or it, you know, it, it wouldn't go over this fence. So yeah. I had to go around. And now the player, all of the work they've done, they can't bank it. <laughs> Even if they die, it's gone <laughs> because yeah. the bike is back here. Yeah. And um, the, the saving at the bike was, was basically a, a, a fix. We put that in, in probably like with eight, eight months to go because uh, we had this great save system that was just working overtime in the background, trying to find ways to always save for the player. And it was doing a great job, but it was invisible to the player. And all mm. they ever saw in our focus tests were the moments when it didn't work as expected or the yeah. fact that it was it was auto. They didn't understand why this was the point they went back to and not something else. So uh, there was a, that was a no win situation to me because I'm like, well, we're already doing so much. There's nothing more we can do. I'm like, how about we make it manual? And and, and for this, I was actually some of our UX um our, our UX leaders, uh, the the uh, the leads at the the user testing facility, uh, had worked on Horizon. So I, I reached out to to them. I'm like, so this, uh, how do people feel about being saving at campfires? And uh, you know, I I forget I forget what the real answer was, but basically they said, oh no, that made the game better. <laughs> you know, because it, yeah. it 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 allowed, I think something along along the lines of it allowed players to know when they're saving and yeah. and it, like they took the burden of yeah. responsibility. So we shifted it from us to them and it, and, uh, it was transformative in a positive way. Yeah. And it, and by saying that it has to happen at the bike again, led to the bike being essential for survival yeah. and, uh, you know, just all kinds of, you know, thinking like that is what led us to just, uh, stick to our guns on things like that, where, um, it is weird to say that you can only save at a bike. That's a random decision, but it, it's something that's informed by the, the, the marketing, but also by, uh, uh something it, it was, we converted a system that wasn't working to something that, uh, that that worked really well, and, and then it just uh, there was a multiplying effect. Yeah. To it. Well, in practice, it, it makes actually a lot of sense. Like your your bike is this 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 moving campfire, like like in Horizon Zero Dawn. It's it's like as you said, you're controlling when you save, and it adds this extra tension that you wouldn't necessarily get if it's invisibly saving in the background. So you don't necessarily know when it's saving. But if I have to abandon my bike temporarily and i have to go off and do a whole other thing and then i accidentally come across a, a horde of freakers but i but they're they're between me and my bike and i'm like oh my god there's this, this whole other <laughs> tension like uh, at, yeah. at play here or if it's one of the, the encampments that i have to take out but my bike is like way really really far away because i've just been sidetracked with with doing different things avoiding enemies or taking out an encampment and i, I lose track of where my bike is i think oh god i, I need to very carefully get back to my bike and and that's the, the survival instincts kicking in again it's like okay i've got to really be careful here because this world is is really dangerous i can't just slaughter through everybody and everything in my way it's not going to work and and that's one of the things that i've I really appreciated as well it's like actually the, it's so well thought out it's like i can i can fuel the bike up i can repair the bike if i have enough scrap and oh okay that that is my my moving save station as well and yeah. it's, it's just really well thought out. Yeah, no, thank you. It was uh, it took us years to to connect all those dots. Yeah, <laughs> you know. And, well, that that's uh, it, yeah. right? If it's the blank piece of paper, it's like okay, that's how we do the bike, and that's how saving works. It'd be super easy, but it's you right. gotta you right. gotta get there. You gotta you gotta stir that pot creatively and say, okay, what's working, what's not working? Oh, and now now we've got the solution. If only it was so easy. <laughs> yeah, to totally. So it's <laughs> yeah. a it was a hell of a ride. It was a hell hell of an experience, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, and, and you obviously mentioned um, the influence of Sons of Anarchy. Is I, I haven't noticed it, but is there a te a Taylor a Taylor Morrow garage somewhere in the world of of Oregon <laughs> in the game? <laughs> no, 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 just in our in our fake version of it. But uh, yeah, that was um, you know, in John Garvin, you know, this was really his his thing. But it was uh, the the early marketing pitch was because uh, you you need to do this as a developer. It's the only language that publishers and you know the, the you know the the people that are writing the checks seem to speak is they yeah. need to understand it and so when it's when it's new ip you got to come up with like it's a cost it's a cross between this and this <laughs> you know so in yeah. our case it was yeah. sons of dead or, or sons of uh, sons of anarchy meets the walking dead <laughs> yeah it's not sons of dead uh and <laughs> like again it was a galvanizing galvanizing idea because all of a sudden we're like okay well we don't know exactly everything it means but now we you know that can that filters yeah. a lot of things out and then it gives us a, a couple you know, it gives us at least a north star for some of these things. Yeah. Uh, it, there's still a lot a to picture. shake out afterwards. Yeah, it, it gives yeah. A, a flavor for people to get their heads around it. At the very least, okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, it's one of those pet peeves. This whenever you see a new game coming out, it's like, oh, that's just that, but it's just this game, but it's a take on it. It, it does feel like like lazy 
review or descriptions, but it, I understand it because it's it's handy for people to get their heads around quickly, even yeah. if yeah. ultimately it's nothing like that. I mean, I, I was playing a game, um, uh, the Pathless, which uh, was by by Giant Squid, and they did the. Uh, uh, abzu and, and that kind of uh, ethereal kind of experience game and i was seeing a lot of um descriptions saying oh it's like breath of the wild but it's kind of like shadow of the colossus and it's kind of like this other thing it's like yeah but the game is its own thing like appreciate it for being its own thing i know i know it's easy to latch on to these things like it's this game but it's also this but it's a, it's, it's a difficult one for for marketing sometimes to really get the header and it's like okay how do we pitch this oh okay it's it's like the it's like the Walking Dead, but it is like Sons of Anarchy, and we're doing this kind of fusion somewhere in the middle, but with our own thing as well. It's uh it's it's tough sometimes to get the right marketing message, uh, and that's just like for an audience that doesn't know anything about your product, let alone the team that has to make the product and and get them right. onto the same vision. Yeah, and it, it's the way we all think. So unfortunately, that's why it's still an effective way of communicating. You know, even yeah. as a designer and player, me and my friends, we we compare other games like, oh, it's like this game, but with this. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's always a modifier to it, at least, <laughs> totally. you know, that, that, that explains the difference. Yeah, Ab- absolutely, absolutely. So um, w- w- you obviously were, were Sony Ben for a long time. Um, a lot of a lot of PSP and Vita games were in that that company's like legacy as well, and then we yeah, you you released Days Gone. How challenging was that from going from like a, a mobile development company for for a number of games, and now finally getting back on to like the home consoles with a with a big production like Days Gone? It was awesome. I mean, we were obviously we all loved the idea of it. Uh, you know, Golden Abyss, Uncharted Golden Abyss on the Vita is it, a uh, still the number one seller. Yeah. on a platform with a pretty low ceiling to it so like you know we you, when you make games you want to you want to reach the largest audience possible yeah so you know it's tough to say if it was because people just wanted the better hardware because i thought we did great with the with constraints before yeah. you always have constraints um but to me it was about just achieving uh it's something that m- more people could play you know and it, it, that a lot more people could play and experience and might know what you worked on or something so um it, it was exciting and, and i would say if we had golden abyss was an, an amazing accomplishment for the studio because um it was a launch title for the hardware and we we had committed to it and we stuck the landing and uh, we even did it with a we were there for the hardware launch in japan uh day one and uh we were still working on the game for america for the for, for the west and um so it uh, there was a whole experience for for the japanese market uh, and then a fuller experience uh, when we launched everywhere else, and then a patch for for Japan. So uh, it was it was a really impressive feat of coordination. And you know, at the studio, we didn't have any producers. We just kind of all figured out how to make it happen, and we made it happen. So Chu, uh, I think he told John at one point at, at a party, uh, he's like, uh, "You have one favor." <laughs> you know, the Golden Abyss is giving you a favor. I I can't remember or not if that's what uh, if we called that one in to, to work on this, but I think that we had shown that we. Uh, you know, that we, uh, we we were always punching out of our weight class, but this yeah. was a chance for us to kind of punch it one level higher. Yeah. And uh, Vita was going the way of the Dodo anyway. So it was a, it, it just was the, the only thing for us to do. And, and they let us do it. And, uh, uh, you know, by, by and large, I think that we delivered. Yeah, 100%. I, I agree. It's, it's absolutely one of the premier titles uh, that is like the must own if you if you have a vita um no that's that's, that's fantastic and you 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 mentioned that you just left uh sony band late last year so what what's the future looking like for your for yourself so uh that's it, a longer and it's a long answer i'll try to give you a short version but basically um we spent seven years on on days gone uh, I've been there for almost 20 years, which is a tough thing to walk away from. But uh, you know, you always look at other opportunities. Yeah. And what I what I realized was, um, man, I don't, I'm not qualified for any of these things. You know, and <laughs> it, it, you know, and and, and in the amount of time that we built um, Days Gone, I would look at other people that we hired or you know, people who were were applying, and, and I'm like, between the years of 2012 and 2019, you did all of this. Oh my God! Like you know, it just, so it it. Yeah. it uh, that type of a time a window of time to work on something is is a is a blessing and a curse mm-hmm. um and the the curse was the thing that really kind of stuck with me was especially when when you miss right like when it when it uh it finally comes out you spent seven years on it like uh, 
some of the some of the uh, the criticisms on the game are kind of original sins that go back many years that you really just can't change or affect or like the, the yeah. dies cast like I said earlier. So um, that's not really saying how long the next bend thing is going to take, but uh, you know Sony lets you take time and and do the right thing. And um, I, I turned fifty. Uh, it last November, and you um, did not. I re- no, way. I did. I did so. I know. I know. I know. I stay out of the sun, so I. I think I. Uh, I, I look two years younger than that. Uh, I look forty-eight, and I'm, I'm like at this at this pace. I have two more games in me. You know, if we, you know, again, that's the days gone rate. Nothing would take yeah. that long. Uh, you would hope, but uh, it just scared me, and I'm like, you know, I, you know, like I, I, I uh, like I said, I hit this milestone in my in my life, and I, I, I kind of want to see. You know, I'd watch documentaries about uh, musicians or movie, you know, filmmakers, and and just see how many relationships they had mm-hmm. with so many different people over over you know shorter periods of time, over for multiple projects, and um, it just really, I feel like I'm missing something. I'm less whole as a developer and a person yeah. by not having those experiences. And um, like I said, I want more than two more games on my resume before I before I get put out to pasture, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> So I was looking for before Days Gone, we shipped a game on average every two years. Um, I, I was looking for something like that, you know, where okay. um, you know you basically have shorter cycles, and um, you can uh, you know you can fail or succeed more regularly. But you know you're not putting all your eggs in the seven year basket. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the things I wanted to look for. I wanted to you know I, uh, I've been in a small town for a long time. I've lived in bigger cities and stuff. So I wanted to wanted to move somewhere else uh, that wasn't uh, Texas or California. So that, you know, kind of my options are starting to filter a little bit. And then, and uh, then I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm tired of working on one platform. Like maybe I want to target a multi-platform company uh, just so, you know, again, to what I said earlier, you, you want to make a game and reach the largest possible audience. Yeah. Um, so as all this stuff started filtering down, uh, I, I kind of, when oh, I wanted to work at a big publisher, cause I was just comfortable with the benefits and just, you know, feeling, yeah, you know, not security. that there are any more skin- <laughs> yeah, I think it's maybe yeah. artificial security, but it's just something that makes you feel better. <laughs> yeah. So um, long story short, um, kind of all of that math equated to um, I took a position at NetherRealm uh, in Chicago where they make Mortal Kombat. Yes. God damn. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it, 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 it's a little bit more complicated than that because I'm, I'm just, you know, at Ben Studio, I was the, the design manager. I was the game director. I was a contributing designer. I was yeah. a bit of a you know, coordinator producer. Like I did, I did a lot of things, uh, and I was also looking to escape that, <laughs> you know. But it, it, uh, <laughs> it um, so, um, and then also looking in, in, you know, to the future of my career. Like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm like, it's like, is game direction an old man's game, or is it a young? You know, is it, it's a young man's game, isn't it? Right, you know. So I, I, I still feel like, uh, you know, it, it's not exclusively, but it should mm-hmm. be you know, people a little bit closer to the cutting edge and having their finger on the pulse. So um, I, there's an emerging thing with design teams getting so large where they need managers. So I took a, 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 de- a design manager position at NetherRealm. And uh, it, it, it's weird so far for me because it's, what, it's exactly what I was looking for. Uh-huh. But uh, before, a lot of my management decisions and game direction decisions were intertwined. And, yeah. uh, you know, like, so that's kind of gone here too. So like, I'm, I'm like a coach in chief. Uh, yeah. for the team at well, this you're point a man, uh, a mentor and, as well to kind of shepherd uh, and cultivate like a like a culture of uh, you know exactly. I- ideas and, and helping out and and really like ushering in the next generation of of the you know cutting edge passionate young designers that like have these ideas but don't necessarily know the best way to go about them or or, or how to even exactly. like deliver the idea and that's just a lot of that is just mentoring and and helping them visualize like what it is that they want to create, and it's okay. This is this is how we can help do that, and really focus you and, and harness you in in the right direction, rather than spinning your wheels on something that you don't know how to get started or get moving. Yeah, theoretically, that's the idea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah. The, that's the general idea. <laughs> Theme is um, great, and it it's uh it's it's interesting because uh like I I've played fighting games, but I'm a button masher. I'm not an expert in any way, shape, or form. And and uh, they actually sold me on that being a strength, uh, you know. For so they convinced me to come there, and, and uh, it, it's great. I love the team, the people. Like it's got a great culture. But uh, it's interesting seeing just how um, so many things are similar, and so many things are completely different. In in good, you know, in some ways better ways, some ways less less good. But uh, uh, it, it's interesting. But that's what I wanted. I wanted to uh, you know learn more ways of, of of building games. I wanted to you know. I want to see a lot more. I want to meet a lot more people. I want to kind of see different ways of doing it. Yeah. And so far it's delivering. 
Awesome. That that that's wonderful. And, and it's great to hear um like where you've landed as well. And also you're you're not getting um like you're not stagnating creatively. You're you're still passionate about wanting to learn and wanting to experience like other teams, other IPs, other other um like other colleagues coming up and and like you can learn from as well and i think that's so important for anybody who's creative is to not stagnate and it's the hardest thing if you're if you're in a company for any significant length of time like how do you stay fresh how do you stay energized about right. like the, the the not just the industry but like the thing that you're doing is it a particular part of the industry that that you're you've been in for so long and like how do you how do you keep everything fresh and 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 stay original and uh, you know that is the 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 classic statement of there there is no originality anymore we're all just riffing off each other and like mm-hmm. borrowing ideas from from everyone and everything and that is uh true to a degree as well but it's it's i think there's always a lot of interesting creative solutions that we just don't know about yet and the more kind of people that we can engage with and and chat to and just get the get different perspectives on is like, we can create some incredible things and uh I, I for one cannot wait to see what Nether Realm do do next as well because I'm a big Mortal Kombat fan. I'm a big Injustice fan as well. Uh, I like you. I am a button masher, but I do. I've got a collection of fight sticks which I love. I I can't yeah. use them at all, but I just love them and I love like the the that feeling of being a child in the arcade again with the big chunky buttons in the arcade stick. Yeah, slapping it, it like this. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I yeah, not gonna fight stick, but I, I, I it, it, it's easier to use a controller. It's weird, <laughs> it's weird but I, I'll do it. You know, it's totally. But, uh, yeah, it's and it's um, yeah, they, you know, they know what they're. As a matter of fact, I think the thing that kind of convinced me that uh, it was for me was um, I really was blown away by how AAA it was. Like, because I, I hadn't looked at fighting games in years. Uh, yeah. You know, like again during the 2010s, I was making one game. <laughs> and I wasn't like looking at everything, and but they, but they released like four games in that time. Yeah. And um, basically, when I played MK11, I was just blown away by the, the 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 polish and the presentation and like the integrity that they bring to Mortal Kombat. Right? Like, if you're an outsider, you just think, "Oh, it's that thing that the that the, the politicians were upset about in the '90s," yeah. and they think, yeah. you know, like you just it's easy to kind of categorize it that way. But there's a lot of there's, it's a rich universe with a lot of full characters and 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 you know just this this great fiction. And uh, they've got lifelong fans, like literally people have been fans since the mid nineties yeah. when they were, when they were five and they're still playing it now. And um, they, uh, they, they just know all the characters in, in, in ins and outs. And the thing that really impresses me about, um, about another realm to talk about stagnation is um, the, you know, they're, you know, through MK 11, they're still innovating. Like they're not just resting on, you know, a scorpion of old or sub zero of old, they're reinventing him every time. Yeah. But they're staying true to the character, but they're bringing something fresh. And, uh, you know, it, it, it seems like it would be so easy for a developer just to go the Madden route and uh, update stats and do a yearly iteration. But uh, they don't. And they, you know, so I'm, I'm really impressed with that type of integrity and, and love for the material that they have. And they're, and they're not tired of it and, and they're not out of ideas. So yeah. it's really impressive to see. And, and it's always staggering how, how much care and attention they put into the story mode for a, for a fighting game. Yeah. Because yeah. usually, usually you think on the surface of a fighting game is just you know one v one or two v two depending on on the mode, and it's just competition based and that's it. But the story of Injustice is phenomenal. It's, it spawned obviously comic books as well. Mortal Kombat Eleven has got an incredible like time bending story as well, um, and that's obviously branching out into a movie that's coming going to be coming out soon. The trailer's obviously been dropping and is getting an anime as well. So it's it's fascinating to see how their IPs for Mortal Kombat have really expanded out. And uh, as you said, the integrity of like the characters, the lore, the universe that they've created is, is super exciting to just see grow and expand into other other mediums, whether it be comic books, whether it be animations or, or film. It's, uh, that's hugely exciting. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's fun to be a part of, for sure. Yeah. So, Jeff, thank you very much for joining me on this episode. This has been an absolutely brilliant episode. We're just over an hour, and it's been a very, very fast hour. I, I ho- hopefully, it's not been a yeah. slow hour for for you. Uh, as no, well. I know. I thought it was five minutes. So, uh... <laughs> I know, I know. So, uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning into this episode of the Weekend Catch Up Club. If you've enjoyed this show, then maybe consider giving the show a like. And if you're, of course, watching on demand, maybe hit that subscribe bell. Until the next time, I will be back with another great guest, and we will see you again very soon. Take care. Bye-bye.